uh, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, inviting Dr. Rahul Shah. Uh, Rahul, please come. Uh, inka cordless mic de ding? Ah, sir, wo hai. First of all, thank you so much. No, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Please welcome uh, Rahul. Uh, I'm meeting Rahul personally for the first time. I have referred some cases to him before this, but never physically met him. Uh, he's a gastroenterologist, an interventional gastroenterologist. Did his MRCP in UK. And uh, of course, uh, after that, he's in Mumbai since 2014. Uh, and. Uh, I think after traveling across various hospitals all over the city, he now concentrates in the suburbs, Nanavati, Kritikair, Aroginidhi. Uh, yeah, Rahul, uh, thank you so much again. Thank you coming. very much, Dr. Shah. And, thank uh, you. Uh, we will start with your talk. Rahul, of course, has some slides to show, so we will take them one by one. Uh, one area in gastroenterology that we all are not familiar with adequately is the area of manometry, sorry. They can't see that side. You will? They, they can't see that side. So okay. That's, uh, <coughs> then he can't see us. So uh, you'll have to stay here. You okay. have to be in the video. <laughs> I have to be in the video. Uh, okay. You want to change positions? Okay. There's a chair, chair here. Uh, <coughs> yeah. So uh, the, an area of manometry. Manometry is done both in the upper GI tract and in the lower GI tract. And we have seldom ourselves ordered manometry for any patient. Uh, and uh, if the gastroenterologist orders manometry, we may or may not know what is the indication and uh, what are the results uh, and how is the interpretation. So first thing that we learn from him is this invasive diagnostic procedure called manometry. So, uh, yeah, Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure you guys remember the past in the 1780s, you had a conventional, but you have a seismograph and you have an earthquake, you have a thing which goes up and down, measures the activity. So in the olden days, you had a conventional manometry, which was exactly the same thing, a catheter which, yeah, a catheter which went from the nose into the esophagus and as the pressure changes happen between the upper sphincter, lower sphincter and the peristalsis happen, the wave would go into a conventional black and white graph. I'm sure some people may have seen it during the medical days. Very old technology. That has been completely revolutionized to make it into a color-coded graph. So what happens, instead of this line, which is a bar graph up and down, it's now into a color-coded system. And anybody who learns the basics of manometry can interpret a basic graph of manometry. So what it does, there's a color. So blue, uh, green, yellow, and then it comes to red and black. So the lower the pressures, it'll be a subtle color like yellow, green. And as the pressure goes up, you get a black color. So how it tells us, if you have a very tight upper sphincter, you might find a black color. If it's a lower sphincter which is tight, it'll become black there. And it'll give you a 3D graph of the motility of the food pipe. As soon as you eat, there's an oropharyngeal function first. So it's a brain telling your uh, pharynx to start the uh, mastication, mastication to the uh, muscles of the tongue, the back of the throat, and then into the esophagus. So this essentially measures from everything from the upper sphincter down to the lower sphincter, and it gives you a 3D graph. So I'm just going to go to the next slide. So I, I don't have a pointer, but I'll try and explain to you. So what you see in the right side, which is the red color bar graph, is what you saw in the past. Of course, this is made from horizontal to vertical because we don't look at the graph anymore. Uh, that's your conventional manometry. You, you can go towards yeah. the screen. Aapko uh, thoda turn hona padega. Okay. So what you see here is a conventional manometry, which tells you what's happening. We don't really concentrate on that at all. So what you see here is a color-coded system from yellow-green to blue, and in this case, there's no black. A little green here. Very simple to understand this. This is the upper sphincter, upper esophageal sphincter. This is a lower esophageal sphincter, and what you see is a peristaltic wave coming down. So as you soon as you take a simple wet swallow, dry swallow, solid, whatever you take, your peristalsis starts here. So I'll point to a couple of things. Upper sphincter at rest is tight. As soon as your uh, swallowing starts, it relaxes. So you get a blue color from being red or green, the pressure relaxes. You see a relaxation of the pressure here. After that, you have a 
upper smooth muscle and then the striated muscle. So esophagus has got striated muscle at top, so the other way around. Striated muscle at top and smooth muscle at the bottom. So there you have a upper uh, peristalsis, a little break, and then the peristaltic wave. It's like a car going down, and as soon as it comes to the LES, there's a breaking point because there's a valve. It's called the GE junction. It is an integral part between the crudal diaphragm, the gastroesophageal valve, which is a circular muscle of the thing. And the moment you go there, this valve will open. So as you see here, very important, the moment you open the upper valve, the lower valve should open. It's a coordination. When this coordination fails, there's a problem. So as soon as you see this is open, that's open. So the lower sphincter is ready for the bolus to come down. And as soon as it comes down, the nerves and muscles, which is the peristalsis, pushes the bolus down and enters the stomach. And then the valve closes. So very simple, very, very simple way of interpreting. So there are some medical terms, uh, which is the proximal segment, not very important in peristalsis, it is automated, like your brain function, it happens automatically. But what comes at the bottom is a, a peristaltic wave. So there are people with two kinds of disorders. So you often see patients with persistent chest pain. I'm sure you've come across, you sent them to cardiologist, ECG, echo, excess, all negative. There are a section of people who have a peristaltic disorder. In which case, if this valve, uh, so the nerve is not functioning, the musculature is not working, they become aperistaltic, which means the moment you swallow, it goes like, goes very, very slow. It sticks in, they say, khana atakta hai. I don't feel well, it's going down slowly. But it may not be a stricture, it may not be a cancer, it may not be something to do with the structural problem of the esophagus. This is purely a physiological problem. So this is the motility. So you can have a peristal which is completely absent, giving you dysphagia, or you could have vice versa. You could have a spastic esophagus. Moment you take it in, it goes into a spasm. Moment you go into a spasm, it chokes, it, it, it irritates the patient, and then goes down. So I'll show you examples, which you can answer rather than me answering. I mean, is this kind of clear to uh, what I'll, I'm saying? I'll, I'll just go back a bit so yeah. that it becomes even more clear. Uh, you are measuring pressures yes. across this. You place a transducer to yeah. measure this. How do you place it? Where do you so, place it? Yeah, so I forgot to speak about that. So there are two kinds of transducers. One's a water perfusion system, a small tiny catheter, which is about the size of uh, seven French, which goes from the nose and into the esophagus, into the stomach. It can be placed and you can look at where the pressure changes, so we know exactly the placement. Or there's something called solid state catheters, not easily available in India because of the cost. Um, so they are basically similar catheters which have concentric sensors all along the, uh, the tube. Very soft tube and it's got constraints, 16 sensors around between the lower and the upper part. So every channel has a sensor, it measures the pressure. So essentially this is like a pixel of your computer. Every time there's a change in the pressure, there's a pixel which goes up and measures the pressure. So all the 16 channels will measure the pressure difference. So the transducer is placed once, Correct. then you make the patient do a dry swallow or a, with some liquid or food? Yeah, so we normally have a wet swallow. Wet swallow. So we'd give 5 ml of water to take via syringe. The moment they take the water in the syringe, this will open up. And then we do it 10 consequent times to get an average reading. So this at the moment is a graph, but we have a lot of readings that we record. So we record the pressure of the UES, uh, pressure of the LES, the contractile integral. So what you see here may be normal, but we need to measure, it's an objective measure. If you have an electric car, it's going to go 180 kilometers, what, what speed is this going? What contractile rate is this happening? So it may look normal to me, but the computer will give me a generated outcome that what is a force of the peristalsis, what is the valve pressure, what is the pressure of relaxation, what's the pressure of the top valve. It gives me a re reading which may not be as important to you than to me. Correct. So uh, as he said before, there are two types of dysphagias. One is a mechanical dysphagia, say due to your tumor, uh, so we will web, etc. stricture, or there is a motor dysphagia, which is basically dysphagia due to abnormal contractions of the esophageal musculature which can be due to central neurological uh, disorders or can be peripheral esophageal disorders. So, uh, so would I be right in saying that manometry of the esophagus is principally done to diagnose dysphagia, which cannot be diagnosed on upper GI endoscopy? Ab absolutely. That would be the indication. If you have a normal endoscopy and you have dysphagia, then you must do a manometry. And the uh, only other indication is chest pain. 
So if you have a central chest pain which is not responding to and is not cardiac in origin, then it's worthwhile doing a manometry. So not responding to reflux medicines, etc. Whatever you have tried empirically, if you have chest pain retrosternal, then maybe you want to look, look at this. Yeah. So what are the diseases that you will diagnose? So the commonest uh, disease, uh, they took, if you have a younger population, the commonest thing I see is achalasia cardia, commonest things. In which case, this valve becomes extremely tight. The peristalsis may or may not be there, but this valve becomes so tight, the moment it goes from the LES to UES, it sticks. It doesn't go down. So that's the condition called achalasia cardia. When this valve does not relax, it becomes very tight. And we can do an easy intervention to treat it. But there are three types. There's type 1, where there is absolutely no motility. Type 2, where it's a spastic kind of pan ischial contraction. Or a third type, which gives you a lot of pain. So the types, again, not important. It's somebody who's got dysphagia, regurgitation of liquid coming from the nose when he lies down, or weight loss, or chest pain. And this is very important. So achalasia also has upper GI endoscopy abnormalities sometimes visible, right? It is not a normal upper GI endoscopy. Not necessary, yes, absolutely. It you could have normal. subtle achalasia where you see a little resistance in the valve, you may not show, but this will definitely pick it up. This will pick it up. Definitely pick it up. Okay, and then it can be surgically or with myomectomy or whatever, yeah, dilatation so treated. The current is we don't do any surgical intervention, we do an endoscopic myotomy called as POEM, per oral endoscopic myotomy which is a very superb uh, technique where we go to the third space, we make a cut in the esophagus, we make a third space into the uh, submucosa, go to the valve, cut it open, come back up and stitch it up. Wow. And it takes an hour and the patient's home within 24 hours. It's called POEM? POEM. Per, per oral? Per oral endoscopic myotomy. 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 Correct. Can you just uh, give us a brief about how does a patient of achalasia, at what age does the patient present? Yeah. What the common thing? So, uh, Echalasia actually is a disease of generally younger population. We don't see a lot of old people. Uh, the four cardinal symptoms. Most important is dysphagia, but it's to liquids, not solids. So conventional tumors, strictures, everything in the esophagus, if it's a structural problem, it'll be a solid which gets stuck. But in this case, it's more to liquids. They have a water glass and they think it's all going to come back up. But they have a solid, it goes down fine. Second thing, regurgitation, very important. But not like a khana upar hai. That's a common, but regurgitation means they sleep and they get food coming or liquid coming from the nose. It's a classical symptom of achalasia. It never happens in any other condition. Water coming up from the nose while lying down. Chest pain, if you have food stagnation in the esophagus, they often tend to get chest pain. And they tend to lose weight. Because of the fact they're not eating, they tend to lose weight. So there's a criteria, uh, again academic, called the ectal. Okay, uh, but four cardinal symptoms he said and if if a patient presents with those four cardinal symptoms, you think of achalasia, maybe you will refer to a gastroenterologist who maybe report a normal endoscopy and then maybe uh, the gastroenterologist will suggest a manometry because this is a curable, treatable condition of dysphagia. Absolutely. Which other cause of uh, abnormal manometry can you tell us? Yeah, so next common indication we get is people who have uh, difficulty in swallowing. So people who have a normal endoscopies, older people who have... Uh, who have uh, absent motility. That's my next common indication. So people who have this normal endoscopy, not able to swallow, they have a completely atonic, aperistaltic esophagus. That's the second most common indication that I see. Is that, what is the disease called? Uh, it's, we label it as a hypotensive or a hypoperistaltic esophagus. esophagus. We, or we don't have a specific name for it. Any particular absent etiology? Motility. So people with Parkinson's is most common that we find people with that. And people older age, people with uh, rare, you know, things like lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, they tend to get a completely aperistaltic esophagus. Any so treatment possible? Unfortunately, we don't have a specific treatment, but we tend to use prokinetics. Okay. They tend to help to some extent, but not a great extent. Any other abnormality? You said sometimes it can be a spasmodic musculature. Yeah, so that's a very important thing. I, uh, I mean, I'll give you a quick uh, example of somebody about a few years ago uh, from Chandigarh. He had such bad chest pain, he had seen a lot of doctors and he uh, was on uh, cocaine, he was on alcohol every night, just, I mean, a true story, I'm not lying, uh, alcohol, cocaine, just to get his pain away, multiple painkillers. Somehow in those days, this is about six, seven years ago, we never had manometry until then. Keep the mic a little. Sorry, we never had manometry until then. If you can't hear me, just tell me, sorry. Uh, we did a manometry, he had a completely spastic black esophagus, so the entire food pipe was completely spastic. And all that we did was 
we did a long myotomy we cut the entire muscle and he's been absolutely fine ever since so grateful that he sends mangoes every year so i mean yeah. and anyway. he can eat mangoes himself uh, of course of yeah. course yeah of course absolutely so, yeah. so, so uh, myotomy again cutting up the uh, esophageal muscle so that you make yeah. space and yeah so uh, this called as a nutcracker esophagus you might have heard diffuse esophageal spasm where you get a you know cock screw pattern of the uh, in the barium if you do bariums in the past you get a cock screw appearance so th that is like a nutcracker esophagus in the manometry terms how rare or common might this be meaning not so common, not so uh, common. definitely so uh, but you do find once in 6 months a patient coming with a spastic achalasia will be commoner achalasia most common absent motility and then the spastic disorders no. scleroderma as i said just now lupus scleroderma sjogrens often tends to cause uh, peristaltic hypoperistaltic hypoperistaltic yeah severe yeah severe pain so if you get severe pain you done cardiac investigations you find nothing it's worth doing this test i mean of course think of people i mean there are a lot of functional patients in society don't yeah. i mean don't uh, think that this is the last last step no you have to think of functional disorders obviously at the same time Where do you do this yourself? Where do you do manometry? Uh, so Nanavati Hospital is an, uh, where I practice nearest. People practice on Chembur. Other places you have uh, Global Hospital, uh, Just Look, Raheja. They all have a manometry machine. Yeah. Okay. So, right. What does it cost? Uh, the cost is between eight thousand to twelve thousand, depending on where you are. So, and it's simple. You come just three hours fasting. Small catheter takes fifteen minutes for the test to be done. Very simple. Oh. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of slides. May yeah, I show please, them? Please, please, yeah. please, please. So, yeah, that's a very, very, very good question. So, uh, ESV, ESV is a very, very uh, new condition. I might say uh, it always presents with one classical symptom: food bolus obstruction in young people. If you had that symptom, food bolus obstruction in young people, people who have atopic dermatitis, asthma, eosinophilia, something that young people. then you need to do a biopsy of the esophagus in which case manometry is not very helpful unfortunately because manometry only picks up peristalsis we don't have any studies about what manometry shows in these patients but we have in, if you do an endoscopic ultrasound then there's a thickened mucosa and submucosa it's full of eosinophilic infiltrates but biopsy is diagnostic if you have more than 15 eosinophils per high power field in in one sample then it's diagnostic treatment is quite simple you give them uh, steroids which are not the you know what you use for bidacinide or uh, 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 forocot but we ask them to swallow it down instead of having the inhaler going to the lung we ask them to swallow this twice a day and we give them a elimination diet we give them a hypoallergic diet we give them uh, sometimes even uh, elemental diet to make them better respules yeah you can do that yeah yeah swallow the respules yeah so Uh, no, it's it's far as not autoimmune. Achalasia is because it's often tends to be people with with diabetes and uh, you know those kind of patients with autoimmune pre predisposition. So yeah. Yeah, uh, you had some slides. Yes, two three slides to you know, what I spoke about. I mean, I'll take you through it. LES. This is just a resting uh, manometry graph of somebody. Uh, LES. Okay. UES. And what you see here uh, is the diaphragmatic pinch when they breathe. There is a little. variation you can pick up a hiatus hernia you can also pick up the pressures in the esophagus this is a resting graph before we give the food bolus okay so what here is what you saw in the first graph nice thing what you see here it is a peristaltic wave is going to the les and really having a hyper contractile end so this if patient has come in with uh, dysphagia chest pain uh, then this is relevant because there this is not achalasia because the les is relaxing here moment the uves opens lex is relaxing but at the lower sphincter there's a spasm the treatment could be something quite simple you can give some uh, uh, delta uh, nifedipine which is uh, 5 mg sublingual before meals make sure they're not hypotensive make them to make sure they sit before eating and that relaxes sphincter it doesn't work then we do a myotomy of this uh, lower esophagus similar to poem so, so something quite similar but this is spastic esophagus this is what the other guy which i was talking about came to so you can see that the um, this is not a peristaltic disorder but it's a really spastic lower esophagus the entire bar graph has turned from being blue to red dark red 
So this guy is not able to swallow, he's not able to eat, he's getting chest pain. Best thing is a long myotomy. There is no other treatment other than giving um, smooth muscle relaxants like calcium channel blockers or doing a long myotomy. There's no other treatment for these disorders. So achalasia, very briefly, uh, this is type 1, I'm not going to go in detail. In type 2, when the food bolus goes down by pressure, by gravity, and something which is called as a little spastic esophagus again, it's kind of going into spasm before going down. These people tend to present with regurgitation, dysphagia, weight loss. Okay, I'll stop for a second. Uh, okay, was that uh, clear enough? Was that clear enough? So, okay. Yeah, this is very new for all of us, yeah. so yeah, obviously. Uh, uh, this is about uh, uh, lower GI manometry or anal manometry. Uh, first, can you tell us where would we want to do an anal manometry? Yeah. So, uh, lower GI has got less indication than upper GI. Uh, you see patient with constipation all the time, right? So, what you have to differentiate first is before you take a patient for manometry is who needs a manometry? Not everybody. So, is it a slow transit constipation? So, are the patients having uh, slow transit young people where they kind of going once every other day because everybody's habit is different you could say going once every other day is normal for you it may, it may not be normal for somebody else so a definition of constipation is important going every day going twice a day going once in three days so you need to have what's normal for that patient then need to identify whether they got a slow transit or an anorectal dysfunction that means that what happens is that the, the stool bolus comes in the rectum and the rectum to the outside, which is the external sphincter, the, uh, uh, the rectum, the, uh, the anterior abdominal wall, the pelvic muscles, they entirely coordinate to have a defecatory movement. So you need to ask the patient a few questions. What do you ask them when you suspect an anorectal dysfunction? Are they putting a finger inside first thing? Are they putting a finger and taking all the stool out? Do they have to sit on the commode for 20, 30, 40 minutes? Do they have to lean forward to pass stool? Do they have to kind of use a stool or an Indian toilet? Because Indian toilet is the most physiological way of defecating actually. It's fantastic. But nobody has it. But do they kind of, you know, put a stool on top and bend over? And of course history. So in particular women in childbirth often tend to have a, a pudendal nerve injury. They have episiotomies. They have had vaginal tears. And they often tend to have incontinence and they tend to have surgeries more often than men do. So they have vaginal hysterectomies. So you need to ask a history. Have they had a rectal intervention? Is there a problem with defecating? In a sense, are they doing finger evacuation, taking time, uh, you know, doing any maneuvers to put pressure on the abdominal wall? You need to ask a good history. If you have a history of anorectal dysfunction, then you need to know the next step. Because it's important to know whether they are having a in coordination between the anterior abdominal wall and the rectum and the sphincter or either one of the all. Because anything fails in the system, then there's a problem. There is a step we may do before called as a MR defecography. If you're suspecting somebody with a rectal intersusception, not common, or you're suspecting somebody with an anatomical problem, like previous surgical issues, then you do an MR defecography, which gives you idea of the structure of the rectum. If you think it's physiological, young women, post-delivery, post-surgeries, uh, uh, then this is a good thing because it tells you what's happening in the rectum. Number one, it'll tell you the rectum pressures. Is the rectal pressure at rest, low, high, normal? It'll tell you when the food, the, not food, is a stool bolus which comes inside. Is it making the expand, uh, rectum capacious? So what happens, people get a huge rectal bolus of stool, but they're not able to get a sensation. So it's called the rectal capacities become increased and they become hypotensive to the stool. Is a valve, most important is the external anal valve. It's a combination of the internal and the external sphincter. 80% pressures come from the internal sphincter, 20% from the external sphincter. It's, it's voluntary. So if you go to stool uh, to pass in the bathroom, then you'll pass, the valve will open. So is a coordination between the rectum, the external sphincter perfect or is it gone? So which is why this is very important. So what we do, we put a catheter uh, from the rectum, about 12 centimeters into the rectum. And there's a balloon at the end of the catheter. The balloon acts as a stool bolus. So we, we don't have, we can't put stool inside. So we put a balloon which is inflated according to uh, what we think is right. So 30 cc, 50 cc, either water or air. The first step is to take a basal manometry. 
very, very important. When you do a, a rectal examination, which you all have done, you might find some people, you put a finger, you can't get it inside. They're so stressed, they are so uncomfortable. So the basal external sphincter pressure is so high, they're not able to relax. Some people, it's wide open. You put a finger, you can put two fingers, three fingers, nothing happens. So first thing is that you check the basal pressures. So this is, again, easy to understand, I'll explain to you. So this is the rectum, this is the valve complex, the external and internal uh, sphincter complex. And the pressure is exactly the same. Lower pressure means yellow, higher pressure means uh, more pressures. So it checks your, uh, this, is a this is not a basal graph, sorry. This is a chap when this guy's squeezing. So what has happened, he's tried to squeeze the external anal sphincter. So first thing we check is the tone of the sphincter. Are they able to squeeze the rectum? Are they able to squeeze the sphincter? And then we check the pressures in the rectum and we check the coordination. So how we do it, we do uh, three or four maneuvers. We first catheter in, basal. Number two, if it's incontinence, we ask them to squeeze. Uh, we ask them to cough, sorry. So if they have a cough and they leak out fluid, you know what's happening to where's the problem. Is the valve become weak or it's become, um, the rectum is incapacious. Then we ask them to do a squeeze maneuver, which is depicted here. We ask them to squeeze two things, not the anterior abdominal wall, the rectum. Squeeze it and show me how you can do it. This is the basal thing. Then we ask them, we put a balloon inside. The balloon, we slowly inflate the pressures and the balloon's lying in the rectum. As the pressure of the balloon increases, uh, they will feel a sensation of stool. So you put the pressure 50, you put a balloon 60, 100, 100, it gives you an idea of the rectal sensitivity. For example, he goes to 50 and feels, oh, I'm gonna go to stool now. These are people who present with small frequent stools. Because the moment the rectum is distended, they feel like passing gas or stool. Some people have a, such a big capacity, they go to 400 cc of balloon of air, and they're not able to feel it. They feel, hang on, I don't feel any stool here. So the treatment is completely different, right? So uh, I'll give you a couple of graphs in this. So it's a little, uh, I couldn't get a better picture, I apologize. So here, as I said to you before, there's resting is here with the pressure are low and they start to squeeze. You can see it's a very non-sustained squeeze. They're not able to sustain it very well. And over here, they're defecating. So they're putting pressure in the rectum and trying to pass the stool out and this lower valve relaxes. It's great for diagnosing young babies with Hirschsprung's disease. So young people who have, you know, young uh, children who come with chronic constipation. The simplest test possible. Put a catheter, there's a reflex called as a recto anal inhibit reflex, R-A-I-R. This is the only reflex which is gone in people with Hirschsprung's disease, which means that they're not able to relax the valve and the patients become constipated. So here, defecation, Valve opens, patient's happy. In some patients, we do a balloon distension and we see what's happening. Moment you distend the rectum, they go into a fear, spasm of the external sphincter. And that is called as a dyssynergic defecation, which means you're trying to squeeze out, but the valve is tight shut, like a Valsava maneuver. So this is a very good technique. It picks up problems. Again, you would do this at Nanavati. Uh, yeah. You would say, have a... Yeah. Correct. Okay. Uh, we go to the next topic, you yeah. have some... So I'll, sk I'll skip that, so it's a bit running a little late. Okay, so imaging. Yeah, so basically uh, one area of knowledge that we have is upper GI endoscopy. We know the regular endoscopes, what they see, what we can see through them. Uh, there are a few advances in uh, endoscopy which are interesting and which I did not know about. And one of them is narrow band, band imaging. So just uh, Very brief. walk us through what is narrow band imaging. Yeah. So I'll show you just a technique, a couple of pictures, so you understand why this is uh, important in the current decade. So as you know, early cancers are very important to pick up. Uh, we had older scopes, like you have old cars, you have better models, better efficiency, same thing here. Very, very simple technique. Uh, each of the companies, Olympus, Pentax, whatever company you choose, has got an advanced imaging technique. So what we see here is white light. What we do is we have a blue and green filter at the edge of the camera. And the blue and green filter only lets uh, the red light be omitted and blue and green goes through. What it does, it highlights, it defines the uh, pathology in any area, any luminal organ, where it be the uterus, urethral tract, GI tract, anywhere. So I'll just give an example what it does. 
uh, it's called narrow band imaging. Narrow means you're taking blue-green filters and removing the rest. Uh, I'll just skip to the next page and I'll come back to this. So what do you see here? It's just an example of how it makes a difference. Top three pictures are all white light standard definition endoscopes. All the three pictures at the bottom are uh, narrow band. Difference is what you can see here, it really outlines the vessels and it outlines the pits in the uh, pits or capillaries architecture of the polyp. And you see, if you see this uh, in a standard endoscopy, there's a stool around, you'll miss it. I'm sure if m most of the endoscopists in the country were like, let's go, let's finish fast, you'll miss this. You'll probably miss this as well. You won't miss this. I understand, you will not miss this. But there's a very high chance you'll miss this or this. Because what you see here is exactly the same background as the background mucosa. What this does, it, it defines the and defines the polyp outline, it defines the architecture and makes it light up. It not only tells me that there's a problem in the intestine, it tells me whether it's cancerous, precancerous, or I can I leave it. So let's go to the previous slide, the previous one. So there's a definition system. One, two, three. So if it's the same color, like the background, it probably is benign. So this is an image enhancement. If it's like this, I mean, I'm sure you can perceive a difference between this and this. So you can see it's coming up as a funny looking blood vessels, white amorphous plaques, something different. This is a pre-cancerous polyp for sure. This is looking different, probably something worrying. This is not. So if I see a polyp which is two millimeters, I will ignore it if it's that. But if I see something here, I want to resect it. And I cannot take a biopsy and resect it because you're only resecting the mucosa. You want to get it from the base so it never comes back again, so which is why this is important. Just go to a couple of slides. So same thing here. I want to show you just the pictures at the bottom. If you can appreciate anything, C and D. There are four pictures of a similar lesion. It's called the laterally spreading tumors in the rectum. These two on top, very easy. You can see it. What about the bottom? Can anybody see anything wrong? I mean, it has to be, I'm telling you, so. So, can you, I mean, you'll miss it, I miss it. Can you see, it's a white light, this is not, which I'm saying is very important. If you see here, it's a flat polyp. And you see here, it's a very subtle irregular in the, mus in the uh, mucosa. So you can pick up things. I would have never, this is easy, anybody can. But this you can't. So this technique will highlight it and tell me this is a cancer. So what he said is that, all you need is to add a filter to the end of the uh, near the light source to be able to get this kind of a picture. There is, it's not a special microscopic view. The endoscope remains the same. Of course, these are high-end endoscopes, so, but they remain the same as the traditional ones. And still, you can get uh, this. So, yeah. does the family physician ever write down to the gastroenterologist, uh, kindly do narrow band imaging? I think you should in the future. I think you should. If you all can afford it, it's not expensive because the scope is exactly the same. You put a button, it switches in one second. Okay. So it's and, dead easy. And is it costlier to the patient? Uh, right now, nobody charges extra for narrowband okay. uh, or for high definition scopes. This is how, what you purchase in your uh, department. But automatically, an, a gastroenterologist will do narrowband imaging yeah. if, so, even if not asked for that. Yeah. We will all do it if we have a doubt. So Barrett's esophagus, which is precancerous, small polyps, we would automatically do a narrowband. Yeah, so I think this is a good, good and simple advancement without any greater technological change uh, in in this. So that's that's quite useful. Okay. Uh, three pictures. Three pictures again. Sure, 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 yeah. sure. So you see here, background looking quite similar, but this is magnified, of course. You can see a polyp which is probably only about three millimeters, but you can see how it stands out and tells us this is precancerous and adenoma. Next one. You see this. Nobody can pick it up on a, on a white light. But you see, this is a definite adenoma. These will become into cancer. So the cancer, adenoma to cancer sequence is five years. You keep this for five years, you'll have a big polyp and a cancer later. These cannot be ignored. Over here again, same thing. What you see, that this is all narrow band. You can see it's a definite demarcation, definite change in the vasculature. You're picking up early polyps, early cancers. Quick guess, this is the last slide for this. What, you, what is this? Somebody said something. FAP, FAP. So familial adenomatous polyposis. So it's a genetic condition. 
just had a recent picture, so I put it up. Okay. Sorry, we'll go okay. to the next one. Uh, yeah, what is uh, US? Uh, so I'm going to have one slide about Streta, the previous slide. Just one slide. Sure. Um, so uh, it, it is not available, it's just going to be available in India soon. It's a great technique, it's called radio frequency ablation. So sir asked me to speak about that before, about radio frequency. So I just um, had one slide. So people have reflux, all of us have reflux. And the valve, the G junction, the valve, which is loose, it can be very, very minor issues. So you have something like grading, one, two, three, four, then there's a big hiatus hernia. If you have a hiatus hernia, surgical operation. But right now we have non-invasive techniques to make this uh, loose valve better. I'm only describing one technique here. Uh, there are multiple techniques, there is uh, devices. But this is a great radio frequency ablation device. So what it does is, got a catheter with a balloon at the end of it. The balloon has got radio frequency um, plates, small plates dotted around. And what you do is go there, place it in the right place, press the button on the generator at 15 watts, it, it burns up the entire G junction. And you do three attempts at this, 30 minutes, and that entire valve will become fibrotic, like the sub will become in a fibrosis, and you'll have a competent G junction with a non-invasive 30-minute procedure, home in one hour. Not Should available, available here soon? Soon, yeah. Soon, yeah, okay. Soon. Um, okay, uh, before I go to the next, how many of you, most of you are above the age of 45, 50, how many of you have had a colonoscopy done as a screening procedure for colon cancer? How many? Nobody? Not a single person? One, one person here? Or two persons there? Three people there? What do you think? We are stupid? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think, uh, no, I think if you, uh, it's a preventive medicine now. Yeah. I mean, you want to get a problem and then come back to you. Correct. So if you're th about the age of 50, uh, you should do a stool occult blood test. Okay. If it's positive, you should get it done. If it's negative, you're okay. So if we do decide uh, to do a colonoscopy for colon cancer pre uh, diagnosis, should we insist on a narrow band? Always, always. You must insist on so narrow band. It's a criteria in the UK and the US. If you're having a screening colonoscopy for cancer, uh, they always, always uh, need to do NBI and they need to take uh, at least 15 minutes on a withdrawal time from cecum to rectum. Okay. It's all recorded. Okay, so you, you know what to do if you do decide to kind of uh, do a preventive colonoscopy. Uh, that is one take home message I think that we should all take. Uh, in fact, I am scheduling my colonoscopy next week, so… Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> oh, with you! <laughs> no. But I think it is important, I think uh, uh, we must screen ourselves, right? Yeah. Is, is uh, stool occult blood as, as good? So if you do a… There are two kinds of testing. One is the conventional, which is the low-cost testing, which is not very sensitive because it picks up non-blood uh, as well. So if you have had beetroot, you've had meat, it's, it's falsely positive. So if you have a good testing method, the immuno method, then it's very sensitive. Okay. The, if it's occurred blood in stool, you should not ignore it, in my opinion, at all. So anybody with three positive occult bloods, please uh, take it seriously. Yeah, okay. Uh, sounds good. Uh, your Endoscop endo endoscopic ultrasound is an investigation that again we are not very familiar with. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us the indications of doing endoscopic ultrasound? So, I'm sure uh, you know what ultrasounds, you know what endoscopes, so it's mixed together. So, the camera, uh, the endoscope has got at the tip of it an ultrasound probe. What it does, it gives me a great advantage. So, you put the scope down like an endoscope into the GI tract and any periluminal organ is accessible. So from the mediastinum to the perigastric organs, say liver, say um, pancreas, lymph nodes in the abdomen, everything periluminal is easily accessible. So for example, if you had a mediastinal lymph node, would you do a CT guided biopsy through the lung? Probably much more invasive. You can just do an endoscopic ultrasound, do a transesophageal biopsy of lymph node, it is completely painless, uh, pretty much no side effects, and you have tissue, which is a biopsy tissue, in a matter of minutes. So any first t uh, reason for using endoscopic ultrasound is tissue acquisition. Pancreas, 
periluminal. Anything periluminal and the pancreas, extremely helpful because pancreas is retroperitoneal. So if you want to biopsy the pancreatic uncinate process or head pancreas, the easiest option is an endoscopic ultrasound. CT guided, you have to go transabdominal or sometimes the uncinate process to the back. Not very easy for uh, uh, the radiologist. The second thing is diagnosis. So when do you need to have an endoscopic ultrasound? So the most common indication is, um, you know, uh, people with dilated bile ducts, suspected stones. We do an MRI scan generally, MRCP, but MRCP has got limitations. Uh, so somebody with a dilated bile duct, dilated pancreatic duct, you know, query something happening, peri region, and EUS is the best test because we go near the ampulla, we switch on to, to the ultrasound mode, and we can see a 3D picture of the entire anatomy around the ampulla. So diagnosis, very important. Uh, tissue acquisition from any of the periluminal organs. And uh, lastly, about intervention. So again, this is um, uh, tertiary interventions. It doesn't happen every day. Uh, and I'll talk about it once we are done with this. So. Sure. So again, uh, endoscopic <coughs> ultrasound, more useful in the upper GI tract. I think no significant indication in the lower GI tract. Uh, only thing indication for EUS in, in the rectum is one, two indications. One is, uh, you want to look at the external sphincter. I spoke about incontinence. So sometimes you get an external sphincter damage. The endoscopic radial ultrasound probe is beautiful to pick up anatomy in the rectum. Okay. So it tells you the sphincter is damaged. Number two is we can also uh, do endoscopic ultrasound for staging rectal cancers. Okay. In the past, we didn't have good CTs, but now CT MRI are very good. But so. in the past, we did use it for staging rectal uh, cancers. Then there are rare indications. We do rectal pelvic abscess drainages, but these are all academic. Not routine. So upper GI and upper upper GI uh, endoscopic ultrasound, and uh, as he said, biopsying not in the lumen of the stomach or the periluminal, meaning say in the mediastinum through the esophageal wall, across the stomach with something else, especially of the uh, uh, bile duct opening, uh, looking at that area, pancreatic uh, biopsies. And Dr. Ajaria told us about transthoracic biopsies guided by CT scan. They have carry the risk in the lung mediation, for example, of pneumothorax. This would not carry the risk of a pneumothorax. And uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, tell us about the therapeutic earning. So I will go very briefly because it's a bit sometimes a bit taxing to the brain. We all post prandial. <laughs> so. The, the reason why we want to do something, uh, it's a great technique, endoscopic ultrasound guided bile drug drainage. So standard is ERCP, we all know. If you have obstructive jaundice, stones, tumors, we do an ERCP to take the stone out, we put a stand, etc. But there are a proportion of people who have obstruction at the ampulla. So they have a tumor in growth, we can't see the ampulla. There's duodenal outlet obstruction, we can't get into the duodenum or there's gastric outlet obstruction, or anatomical problems, like people had previous surgeries. So it would be like distal gastrectomies, people who had Bilroth's, uh, Rue and White gastrostomies. There is no access to the ampulla. You can't get there physically. So you have to find a way of doing it. In the past, you could do PTBD, so you could do a drain the bile duct from the outside, uh, or you have to do something invasive surgical, which is a no-no. But now what we can do is we can drain the bile duct in a different way. Instead of draining from where it's opening in the ampulla, we can drain it from the liver or we can drain it from the bile duct into the duodenum. So I'll just explain to you quickly. So uh, before I go ahead, just going back a bit, we are talking about obstructive jaundice due to some malignancy. Uh, obstructive jaundice can be a debilitating situation. And as he said, sometimes you can't open the CBD from where it should be opened from the duodenum. Uh, and therefore you open this, I mean drain the bile through some other route. Absolutely, absolutely. And what route? So you can drain the bile duct from the liver or you can drain it from the bile duct directly. So I'll show you two pictures so you understand. Uh, one is this, it's a final picture but important. You see the, this is the endoscope. It is puncturing the bile duct. So you go to the duodenum, you puncture the bile duct on an endoscopic ultrasound guided view. So there's a channel which has got a needle, you puncture it. You puncture the bile duct, put contrast. Uh, it's a long process, not easy, but I'm just giving you a brief. Uh, and then you place the stent. So this stent is placed, instead of, there's a D1, D2 blockage here. You can't see the way to go to D2, so you can't get to the ampulla. So there's no way of draining this boy. What you do is you put a stent between the bile duct and here, which is D1. It's a great procedure. 
it, it works really well. It prevents you doing a very morbid PTBD which needs external drainage, time, etc. And this tent is a metal stent, so it works beautifully, doesn't get blocked. Simple thing. I'll just show one more. So this is HGS, hepaticogastrostomy. Easier to understand. Uh, you see the liver's here, stomach is right here. You puncture from the stomach, the liver, the left-sided duct with a needle. Same, you puncture with a needle, put a wire down into the, uh, deep into the bile duct, and you place a stent between the left lobe of the liver and the stomach, okay? It, it's not very easy, it takes time, it's a lot of technique and wires in, uh, involved, but the stent is placed in the stomach, draining the liver from the top. So instead of, if your stomach, you got pyloric obstruction, you got diurnal obstruction, it doesn't matter. You don't need PTV, this is internal drainage. So it's more physiological, it drains from the liver into the stomach in the matter of one hour. Patient can go home, there's no surgical intervention done again. So, um, I'll skip the slide, sorry. Third intervention, I'll, again briefly, is something was, uh, which is a very, very beautiful, elegant technique called as eoscaric gastrojejunostomy. Uh, I mean, my last couple of slides. So in this, you know, if you have a gastric outlet obstruction, again, cancers, extremely morbid. The death from cancer is from gastric outlet obstructions because of malnourishment. They can't eat or they can't drink. Extremely debilating. So what we tend to do is we used to do either an enteral stent. We put a stent which goes from the stomach to the intestine. The outcomes are very, very, very average, not very good. But that was a palliative procedure. We had to accept it. Or you do a surgical bypass. Again, very morbid. So what we do now is uh, very simple. Uh, we put a camera, uh, ultrasound, to the stomach. And through the stomach, we visualize the jejunum. Jejunum is somewhere down. So stomach here, jejunum down. We put some contrast in the jejunum, uh, dye and a contrast. And we fill the jejunum with lots and lots of liquid, like make it into an ocean. Once it becomes into a big fluid-filled loop, what we do is we puncture the jejunum from the stomach with a needle. And these are special stents called as a lumen opposing stents. They, have, they got like an umbrella flanges on both sides. So what happens is you simply puncture the dilated jejunum, you deploy the stent, end of story. So within 30, 40 minutes, you got a person who's got gastric outlet obstruction with malnourishment, vomiting, into a connection between the stomach straight to jejunum. Patient can go home in one day. So again, a very relatively safe the only problem is the stent. The stents are really expensive. So uh, uh, these are called as hot stents, hot lumen opposing stents. So they have a cautery device at the tip. You puncture, deploy the stent, end of story. They cost three lakh rupees, but a surgery would cost you five lakh rupees. So it is an advantage, but it works really well. Several palliative procedures possible in patients with either obstructive jaundice or in uh, gastric outlet obstruction. Yeah, okay. Uh, one more area that I would like you to cover. The, the commonest invasive procedure that we see, which is um, uh, palliative, is PEG, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. Yeah. Now, this is, a, this is the commonest thing that we see, uh, besides upper GI and lower yes. GI endoscopies. Uh, is there any advancement there uh, in that area related to ultrasound or otherwise? No, unfortunately we cannot, uh, we don't have any advancements in PEC tube um, because it, endoscopic ultrasound doesn't help really in this. Okay. So this is a palliative thing. I mean, if it's a very uh, gruesome procedure. I myself find it quite intrusive. You're putting a you know, camera down, pulling the tube back up. It's not nice. So just explain to us what is PEG. So what we do is it's percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. So people who can't feed because of stroke, or uh, they have uh, end-stage dementia, whatever indication you're using it for, or they have a malignancy over here which is not, uh, they're not able to swallow. So we place a tube directly into the stomach. The way we do it is we put a camera uh, into the stomach. We have to find a way to negotiate this. If you have to dilate it, we go into the stomach and then we inflate the stomach with air. Then we puncture the stomach from the anterior abdominal wall with a needle. The needle has got a thread. We pull the thread out from the mouth again, and then we railroad a tube, which has got a, a flange at the end. We tube, pull the tube, and which comes out from the stomach. So it's a, not a nice procedure, it's not elegant, but it's actually a very, very useful way to treat patients with end-stage malignancy, Parkinson's, dementia, uh, 
because of oropharyngeal cancers, they've had radiation problems and they can't swallow, then this is a great procedure to palliatively feed the patients. Uh, very safe. Any other feeding procedure device? So um, you, we don't have anything else except no. NJ tubes. So uh, NJ tubes are less used, but uh, we feed the jejunum directly. But PEG is great. We can also have a PEG jejunal extension. So people who have a gastric problem, we can put a jejunal extension to, to the feed pain. them as well. Yeah, okay. but no new things. Uh, about pancreatic tumors, you said radio frequency ablation is possible. Yeah. Curative intent. Curative intent. So in a very select few patients who have not an adenocarcinoma of this, the pancreas, very important. So it should not be an adenocarcinoma. If they have an insulinoma, a neuroendocrine tumor, which is low grade, grade one, in, in the pancreas, we can do a radio frequency ablation. So what we do is, a couple of slides back, there was the RFA picture. Um, no, after, the, after, the, after. No, oh, yeah, yeah, this before. So what happens uh, in this is very simple. You can access the pancreas very easily. So we have a special probe called the Habib probe uh, and the other companies who make it. It's got a radio frequency uh, tip. So we only have to go and puncture the tumor at the center of the tumor. And once we puncture the center of the tumor, you apply the radio frequency generator. So we do it three times again, uh, depending on the tumor, 15 watts, and it ablates the entire area. It's exactly similar to liver uh, cancer ablation. So you have RFA ablation, you have micro ablation, you have uh, you know micro bead ablation, whatever technique you use, taste, waste, whatever, tear, for liver cancers, exactly same here. It should be only used in select patients, the tumor less than three centimeters with no vascular involvement and palliative intent in some patients, curative intent only in a very, very few patients. Uh, last thing uh, from my side, then of course you can, uh, we'll keep it open for the others. For obesity, we have several surgeries. Oh, yes, yes. Are there any endoscopic procedures for obesity? Yeah, so we do uh, two things endoscopically. We do endoscopic balloon placement. So um, essentially your gastric fundus is a sensor for satiety. So when, what this balloon principle is, the balloon goes in and sits in the fundus and it's inflated to depending 400 cc of water to 800 and it gives you a sense of satiety. Once you give a sense of satiety, people eat less. So that gives you uh, weight loss. Uh, my personal experience is not very good because what happens is people who only were binge eaters, who have a high gastric capacity, they tend to tolerate the balloon well. People who eat less and are still obese because of metabolic dysfunction, many mechanisms, they don't do very well. So balloons are reserved to only people who are very morbidly obese, who have uh, eating a lot of food and have a high gastric capacity. It's good for them. Very simple to place the balloon, inflate it. Uh, they can have side effects. They have vomiting, recurrent nausea, fullness, satiety, pain. So it may or may not be good for people. Second thing what we do is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. So how do you have surgical sleeves? We, you know, laparoscopically would stitch the stomach into half. Now what we can do is we can stitch the stomach internally uh, into half, not half, but 30%. Uh, so we take stitches in the gastric rugae folds uh, one by one and we achieve a reduction of the gastric volume by about 30%. Uh, there are long-term data out, five-year data out recently, which is mixed bag. Uh, so surgical sleeves are better. Endoscopic sleeves need a little refinement, I would say, okay. I would think. Uh, I'm keeping it open for the audience. Anything else that you need to ask? Entroscopy. So entroscopy, uh, the two main indications, obscure or occult GI bleed. So somebody who's in a normal endoscopy, colonoscopy, having melina, uh, having occult blood positive, losing blood, then entroscopy. Two ways, anti-grade, retrograde. Problem with anti-grade, it's a long procedure. It takes about two hours each way to finish the six meter small bowel. So you could do a capsule endoscopy in the beginning. So capsule's got a camera at the end of it. You swallow it, takes a picture of the entire small bowel. Completely non-invasive, costs little money, unfortunately, but very good. I mean, the entroscopy will cost you equal money. Capsule is diagnostic, entroscopy can be therapeutic. But you need to know where you want to target your lesion. Because if you are going, if your problem is an upper intestine and you're going retrograde, then it's a waste of money and time. It's long and it's not easy, the procedure. It's quite taxing for the doctor. Two hours of going in, 
and it's under general anesthesia so mission is to be missed yeah so and trust me because you you your scope is turned into a twisted small bowl so no matter how much you are doing you still can miss some things like the capsule as well capsule has got a 360 degrees camera top but the newer capsules have got front and back cameras the camera front and back so you can see everything around technology will advance it okay. will be better yeah mbi anywhere nbi in the urethra upper gi vagina anywhere absolutely so the urologists also practice it but gastros our main field is early gastric cancer early colon cancer so in japan uh, if you go you would not get a each gastroscopy last 45 minutes i've been there for training and i got so bored because one patient on the table like they would go on and on and on because it's so common there but they do it over 40 to 45 minutes each gastroscopy yeah No, you, you need to know it's a spontaneous adenoma to cancer sequence, or it's a genetic cancer. So if you have one single family member, we would still treat it as sporadic cancer. If you have multiple members, young age, below the age of 45, then you would think of screening the brother, son, etc. So you need to establish. You need a genetic uh, testing done. I would not go for otherwise. Oh, US is much better than MRCP. He's much asking uh, endoscopic ultrasound removal of CBD stones versus ERCP based removal. No diagnosis. Acha, okay. Endoscopic ultrasound is the best test for diagnosing CBD stones. The only thing it's invasive. It needs anesthesia. I mean, I mean, I would prefer MRCP. But if you had the luxury, if you know you want to do an ERCP on table, do an US first. Confirm the stone or absence of stone, and then go ahead. and therapeutically ercp versus us removal of cbd stones so uh, we never use uh, us for cbd stone removal unless we fail cannulation okay in which case we have to do a little complex technique or uh, called as rendezvous we punch the bile duct find the ampulla and then do it oh, okay. so cbd stone is a benign con any benign conditions we have to put a plastic stent we can't put a metal stent and we would like to go to the physiological place of exit which is ampulla not some new place Because then it causes a fistula sometimes. So only malignant conditions. Benign, we would have to choose a rendezvous approach. Okay. Little complex. I mean, Fair so. Okay. Yeah. So I think it depends how scared you are. If your occult blood is negative, it's very unusual to have colon cancer. I must say. Yeah, I understand. Very unusual. So, have you come across that? Uh, yeah. The re the reason. Okay. Where? Three occult bloods negative. Negative. Wow. Uh, is, um, it might be a techno technical problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. The stool not Because being examined properly. If you have a cancer, you're leaking blood. You become anemic. The phys the fundamental of doing a. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think sometimes testing, as he said, stool local blood can be tested by the regular GOAC test, which may not be very sensitive. Correct. Whereas the other test that you said. Yeah. What is the test that you said? It's immuno. Immuno. Immuno histochemistry. Is it? No. no, it is not immuno histochemistry. It's a uh, uh, one is a GOAC based test, which is more sensitive, and the other one is a conventional, which I forget the name. I'm just okay. blank. Yeah, I'm just thinking the other name. I'm just blank. Just give me a minute. It'll come back no, to no, me. No. But it depends on lab testing. If you go to a local lab, who's doing the stool for the heck of it, it's not very sensitive. I'll be honest. If you need to do a test, you need to be. In, it's like buying a Mercedes car versus a, you know, Tata, right? So if you have a better car, you have better technology, better equipment. Same thing. If you go to a good lab and do a test, I think you should not be negative, in my opinion, because you have a ulcerated tumor or growth. It has to have. Occult blood positivity. I mean. My God. I mean, unfortunately, medicine is not straightforward sometimes, so we have to. But generally, okay. Are yeah, you telling? Uh, 
uh, I think uh, we must thank Dr. Rahul for first of all coming uh, last minute. Thank you. And uh, Rahul, this is something that we made for you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank and, you so much. Uh, I hope to see you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just to uh, give you a quick brief, uh, the as, you, as I have written in the message. Uh, about 60% of the program has been sponsored by Lakshmi Chand Gada of the Society Store. So uh, uh, we thank him. He is not here, but we thank him. And uh, and uh, all of July and August, we hope to have a program every Sunday morning uh, in Jamnabai School Auditorium or the auditorium of um, uh, Jamnabai Sister School in Kandivli East. Uh, I don't remember the name of that school. So, uh, this place is expensive. Jamnabai is better. And uh, they, of course, provide us the place for free and the food is very, very reasonable. So, uh, every Sunday, July, August, we'll be doing. And three days in July, we'll be also going to Flame University, Pune. Uh, all those who can come for a two and a half day event there. Uh, which we have done before also, some of you have come. So, uh, hope to see you, continue to see you in all our uh, programs. Thank you so much for coming.